Growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Lionhearted Dentist. Last week, I was talking to you about the danger of doing nothing in your career. And it's so easy for us to do that because we work really hard. And it's easy to get to the end of the day and just not deal with anything, right? And go home for the weekend, deal with our breakaway time with our families and things, and then it's Monday morning again. And that that story can turn into a couple years. And that's why I felt it so important to talk about it. And I have a little bit of the end of that I want to finish about what you can do if you're not sure that you're happy. And then I want to get in for my favorite topic to you of all time for the millionth time about case acceptance and why why is it so challenging and how to overcome that as if it's not, as if it's just an easy part of dentistry because it is absolutely one of my favorite parts of dentistry. Walking into a room with a patient I don't know and enlightening them to the possibilities, even if they don't do it. It really is. I don't know. It just call me weird, but I love that. So let me go back one second to finish the end of the last one. I, I ended that podcast about the danger of doing nothing by asking you, well, what is it about your career that right now that you may not like? Too many hours would be an easy answer to fix. You know, I even brought up where you live. Like maybe you're forced to live somewhere because you don't have it thought it out in your mind that, that just gives you nothing to do when you're not working. Like I live a, an hour away from where I work each way for the last 13 years. And you know what? It is absolutely worth it for me. It makes me very happy. I can remember, I want to tell you something. So I lived in my hometown for about five years when I became a dentist. And I was miserable because there was never a breakaway for me. You know, I didn't live in the suburbs of Atlanta, Chicago, New York, LA, and that's me. I, I'm, of course, you got to live where you want to live. You know, the upside, it's very rural. Land is cheap. But it didn't matter because I, if I wanted to do anything, and that's my personality, I had to travel far, like an hour, to do it. And I remember thinking that, gosh, if I move, it's going to have a bad reflection on my patients. I actually felt that I could not move out of the community. I mean, maybe that sounds bizarre to some of you. It does to me now. Not for the reason of anything other than it popped in my head. I'll tell you a similar thing. I can literally remember the point in my career very early on when I realized that we don't have to clean every new patient and we're not going to clean new patients unless it's just a allowable time thing. You know, they're under 18 years old, or we have that time in that slot to do that. I remember thinking that you had to do a profi because that's what most patients get elsewhere at another office. I know I'm off the track of what I want to talk about. And a lot of what happens in dentistry, not getting paid up front, thinking you can't do that, uh, not going out of network is all in your head. And it all revolves around what, what happens to many people, not just in dentistry, but in life, due to your own insecurities and your fears. And I've talked about this. Man, It's you have to believe me. You have to believe that I get on here once a week, sometimes worried about if what I have to say is worthy to you, and espouse to you the things that I've known for a long time, some of which I wish I knew a long time ago. So where you live, if you don't like it, man, you need to get to where you like to live because you're going you're gonna to go through life and you're going to be unhappy. But most importantly, 
You know, I asked you if you ever get excited about an upcoming day, about what the procedures you're going to do. I know many of you are not excited about what you're going to face next Monday. Why? Because it's going to be the same thing you always face. A bunch of fillings. Maybe a crown here and there. So we can talk about this, about the change on that. And, and you know what I'm going to say. But listen, that's why I put it this way. That's why I said to you the danger of doing nothing. Because it is easy to let a couple years go by and do nothing. I know it is. So you owe it to yourself if you're in this situation. You have to sign up and take some CE in arenas of dentistry that you haven't ventured into. That may be up your alley. And it may be some of you think molar endo or endo skills are just unattainable to you. And the beautiful thing that you always hear me reiterate on these podcasts is we have one of the best professions in the world for expanding your skill set in the CEs curriculums that are all over this nation. That didn't exist 40 years ago. There weren't continuums like there are now. Anybody listening, if you really wanted to, could go out and take Buchanan's course or the other uh, Cliff. Huddle, Ruddle, I'm sorry. He's worthy of me knowing his name. He doesn't know my name. And become incredibly proficient in endodontics. And you might be thinking, now, if you hate that stuff, I guess don't try that. But maybe it just seems too daunting to you. You owe it to yourself right now, whether you're 28 years old or 58 years old. And you still want to be in dentistry, but you're not happy because you don't like the services that you get to do each week. Ortho would be another one. See, I never had an interest in ortho. I tried. I tried to get my orthodontist, who I gave many cases to, to personally teach me uh, how to extrude teeth, which I did over my career. You know, extruding teeth for aesthetic reasons bringing gingival margins down, gaining a ferrule so I could crown the tooth. Gosh, I've done a little bit of everything. But you know, there's six-month ortho, there's Invisalign. You know, it just wasn't for me. So maybe it's for you. Surgery, which you know, is absolutely one of my... It's my favorite. For me, it worked. So... And I'm going to tell you something about that for a minute. A couple things I want to tell you about my road. So my original surgery course that I took, I took some pig jaw courses, I think, back in the late 80s, early 90s, practicing on pig jaws, periodontal surgery type of things. And I don't remember a traumatic extraction courses. I did take uh, one course very, very early on. But when I went first to take the Mish Institute nine-month course in surgical and prosthetic, um, mostly surgical, continuum, I dropped it like two years in a row. And even when I took it on the third year, I remember feeling intimidated. I thought I was a pretty good surgeon at that point. And I remember being intimidated because... When you force yourself to get out in a group of, a large group of dentists, you know, it's natural to self-compare, you know, and I couldn't help it, but I stuck with it and it was life-changing for me as, as all of you know. I mean, here I am today offering my own courses and it was the best move I ever made. So I say that to you because it wasn't like I was natural. I can't overemphasize this to you. I've said it many, many times. Getting out and taking live CE is exponentially the best thing you could ever do in your career because you meet like-minded dentists. You also meet you-know-whats, you know, but that's life anyway. So that doesn't mean don't take CE. So you need to get out there. This needs to be the year. You got to be honest to yourself. You know, don't tell me you're taking a lot of courses if they're not live. 
Go out and take a live course on endo. Take my surgery course. Take somebody else's surgery course. But make sure it's live. Make sure... And now, you're not going to get to do live endo on a patient or ortho. And I don't know if you need to. Surgically, you do need to be working on live patients in that kind of setting. So I know there's others besides mine. You know about my courses from Rasner Institute Online. You need to do that before you give up on dentistry. And if you do nothing else, for goodness sakes, look into your countries, for those of you globally and those of you in the United States, look into what it takes to get an enteral permit, oral sedation permit. It is life-changing no matter what services you provide. It is the lifeline to give you a long career, without a doubt. And if you're tuning in for the first time ever, or you've just tuned in in the last couple weeks, I have many, many podcasts on oral sedation. My cocktail, I believe, is second to none. I've never met anyone introduce me to a protocol that was as nearly as effective as the one that I use. And you can write to me. It never gets tiring for me or Beth to send you the protocol that we have in writing. So that's what you do. I want to spend the second half of this on something that's obvious to me, maybe not obvious to you. Why is case acceptance, and trust me it is, so challenging for so many of us? And I'm going to tell you why. The why is why you have to be prepared. The why that I'm about to tell you is exactly the reason you have to dedicate unbelievable amount of time to that process in your office, the new patient experience process. You cannot refine this enough. Because this is why it's hard. I want you to really picture this. You have a new patient next week. I want you to think about this. This patient found you somehow. They found you through your marketing or somebody recommended you, which would be better. And they decide to pick up the telephone, stay with me, and call your office. And so the first moment of case acceptance is right then. Do you or do you not have someone manning the phones that is exquisite with new people? I do. I've never seen her off in 40 years. I don't even know what I would do. I do know what I would do. I would find somebody, train and train, and keep changing if I had to until I had somebody be able to master that first phone call. And many, many times I've offered to you to pick up the, take my email down, take Michelle, who's the person I'm speaking of, Michelle Bondi. Here, I gave you her name. Uh, write to her first, get her to spend a little time with you. I mean, it's the gateway to absolutely everything we do. The first person, if they're bad, you never get to work any magic you may have or not have anyway. So that's the first move. But think about it. The problem is this, that there's just such a huge body of your profession and mine that don't approach it with a comprehensive approach. How this happened, I just don't know. It's always been there. The comprehensive approach has gone back to everybody that ever taught me dentistry. Morty Amsterdam, Dean Walter Cohen, Jay Siebert. These are all people that were legendary at the University of Pennsylvania in 1980. On and on and on. I, I can't even, for this moment, I can't think of their names. Dozens. They did it back in the 1940s and 50s. And their disciples are doing it today, as do I. But most of your colleagues don't. So think about it. Population in general is made up, in my opinion, of a body of consumers that are suspicious, very, very 
much uninformed by us, by your colleagues, and very capricious. Yep, they're suspicious that what you say about their mouth. I had a patient last week that went to a dentist nearby me who recently passed away. This guy was my age, one year older, very smart, much smarter than I am. Intimidating. I knew him as a kid, by the way, because this is the town I grew up in. And he went to dental school and I was a year behind or two. And he had many, many other interests besides dentistry. And that dominated his life. And he really became, as smart as he was, a patch fill type of dentist. Even though he clearly had the skills to be otherwise. He just didn't have the interest to continue the pursuit of CE or whatever to perfect the skills that need to be perfected because you don't have them out of dental school. And I inherited one of his patients. Guy had a good job. Uh, Seven years old. I knew the guy because it says, I just said to you, he's from my hometown. But I hadn't had any contact with him in 40 years. But the dentist I just alluded to had passed. So some of his patients are spreading out into the communities. And this guy ends up in my chair. He had good perio. He came to me with a chief complaint that my teeth are falling apart. And he was the poster child for good old Dr. Joe. And if you haven't heard who good old Dr. Joe is, Dr. Joe is that doctor that patients go to that they love. They love him because they never need anything. We're going to watch that. You'll be okay. Watch this. Watch that. Watch your periodontal disease go from a two to a four. Watch your perio pockets go from fours to nines. Because why? Because what we treat is usually asymptomatic. A lot of the pathology we witness has no symptoms. And that was this guy, except he didn't have perio problems. He had the potential to have a superb mouth, but every tooth in his mouth, with very few exceptions, was restored with, I'm not kidding, five plus surface fillings, with some of the fillings missing, recurrent decay, blah, blah, blah. So that's a very awkward position for me, as it is you. That's a whole podcast because a lot of you are in that situation. I know you are when you bought the practice of another good guy, but a good old Dr. Joe. And remember, Dr. Joe's patients love him. They never spend any money. All my extraction and implant patients in my courses love me unequivocally. They should. It doesn't cost anything. They accept everything I say. You hear me? That's the challenge. So here you come along, and hell, the Reader's Digest article of 30 years ago still resonates in the public, where one Reader Digest editor went to 10 offices and got 10 different treatment plans in the 1990s, early 90s, I guess, from needing no work to needing $30,000. Let's not put a blanket over our head, that is out there with many consumers. So you don't even have to be good old Dr. Joe. There's many in between Dr. Dr. Dentist who don't treat comprehensive dentistry. They treat what the patient came for and they don't look at the entire mouth. Does anybody, those of you that have known me for a couple of years now doing these, does any one person think I possibly do a comprehensive care exam because I want to make a lot of money? I mean, if that ever came across your mind for one second, then you shouldn't watch these anymore because you have no idea of who I am and what I'm trying to profess to you to make you a fulfill, help you have a fulfilled career. It's just the way dentistry was meant to be. How silly of us to even question that.
So here's the problem. Much of what we treat is asymptomatic. It doesn't hurt. When's the last time you had a patient come in and say, could you check my gums? They're aching me crazy. They, no, they might tell you they bleed. That's great if they do. But the majority of people, I have to say, that need scaling root planing and even more, don't even know they need it. I had a patient come in. I want you to hear this too. I, I share these with you because I think you can relate to them. I had a patient been my patient for 20 years. What I didn't know is he hadn't been in three years. Not my fault. We have it documented to death. Recalled, broke, recalled, broke. I didn't know, though, that he had denied periapicals since 2013. Check this out. Check this out next time a patient denies periapicals. This is a quality guy, by the way. 52 years old. I work on his brother. I worked on him. I never did any significant work to him, ever. Doesn't have perio. Comes in after three years. Sits in my chair. And he had some abfractions on certain teeth. In particular, 7, 8, and 10. Not 9. So bad. He got root caries up the root. He doesn't know this. It doesn't hurt. That he needs to have them extracted. There's no way to save them. Three teeth. Two for sure. I'm not sure about the third. And he is in my chair annoyingly in disbelief, quote-unquote. How could this happen? And somehow, in the scope of the last eight years, I wasn't aware that he not acquiesced to an FMX. And by the way, these were like the only three teeth affected by him. So that's a patient that knows me. I've treated many of his family members, including his father, and sits there and will not own his mouth. He is not accountable. That's why this is so hard. Even when you do everything right, the way I have for so many years in terms of my examinations and recommendations, charting that they decline this and that, it's hard. I can't imagine somebody saying, oh my God, I should have listened to you. That would have made sense to me. I get that. Neither one of this, the one from the prior patient, from good old Dr. Joe, he didn't accept my recommendations. And I tried desperately to minimize his needs, meaning there's a couple of teeth I would, my treatment plan to fill that were pushing the border, but he still needed eight crowns blindfolded. Did not accept. I assure you, he will find another dentist that will fill these teeth again. He'll find another good old Dr. Joe. And this patient, I don't know what he does, he's going to do. Um, it's going to be a different story because he's going to lose two teeth for sure. And he's going to need implants through his front teeth. Anyway, I guess the point I'm making to you is that's why this is so challenging. And that is why it calls for exquisite documentation, a thought-out approach from the new person taking that call to what's going on, to the follow-up notes that you compile, to cover yourself. And we probably should talk more about that next time around. But, you know, I guess the takeaway here, if you're not happy with your case acceptance level, it is something that simply requires more diligence and time by you and can be, and I'd be glad to help any of you with different aspects of this. And I know for a fact that many of my colleagues struggle with this part of dentistry, or you don't even know you struggle. You think that just doing one crown or two crowns or whatever, you th that is what needs to be done because you even you may not have bought into the advantage of a comprehensive exam. You know, if you do a comprehensive exam like I did on both of these patients I just talked about, and they don't accept and they don't accept, what else can you do? Remember I said the goal is for them to always leave with a good taste in their mouth. Like I don't know whether either one of these did, but I will tell you I'm accountable. And in this case, both of them, it wouldn't be because of me because I wasn't selling them. 
I wasn't hard pressuring him. I was explaining, educating, doing all the things that LD Pankey said you should do many years ago before me. Have a great week. I hope you continue to watch. Write to me, Dr. Rasner at AOL.com. D-R-R-A-S-N-E-R at AOL.com. And my course may have an opening or not if you're interested in trying surgery and just two short months away, September, I think, 24th and 25th. See you next week on The Lionhearted.